Hey, what's up everyone? I just upgraded my Cubase to Cubase 10.5, the brand new one that just came out today. I've been monkeying around with it for a few hours and I'm gonna tell you all seven first impressions and then get to whether or not I think the upgrade is worth it. So let's get into it. Okay, so we're here in Cubase, and 10.5 has a few new features that I really like. We're gonna start with uh, new instruments, because I love getting new instruments. So we'll just open this up. Uh, Pad Shop has become Pad Shop 2. Uh, and what I like about it is that I, this is my old template, and if you had the old Pad Shop, or if you had Pad Shop Pro, it automatically upgrades it to Pad Shop 2. That's for Cubase Pro. Now, if you don't know what this is, this is their, I think it's my second favorite of their synths. It's the one that's more focused on pad sounds. And it's sick, but one cool thing about Pad Shop 2 is that it incorporates the killer feature that differentiated Pad Shop Pro from Pad Shop, which is that you can drag user samples into it. So if I come here to my media bay and I search loops and samples, so you can come here, go to loops and samples, and I'll just search like an aw sound or something. Aw. Okay, and then we just drag it in. That becomes our oscillator now for Pad Shop, and you can. So you can use user samples as the oscillator in Pad Shop, and that is super cool. I'm going to get deeper into Pad Shop 2, see how it differs and is similar to Pad Shop 1, and I'll do a video about that, but that's a discussion for another time. So that is one thing you get with the brand new update. You get Pad Shop 2 instead of the old school Pad Shop, and you get some of the functionality that was available only to Pad Shop Pro users previously. Let's move on to my second new thing that I think is pretty cool. It is a new plugin called multi-tap delay. So I have this Rhodes fired up. And we'll fire up this multi-tap delay. And what it is is, you know, it functions like a delay. But you can add tap points to it. Which is sick. So you could actually, uh, if, if the you can actually tap in rhythms. One, two, and then you'll get. Which is also sweet. Um, there's a ducker function, so you can duck some of your delay, a uh, mixer function, and another thing that's cool is you can assign panorama to it so it can uh, do a ping pong type thing or just a straight delay in both ears um, and th the taps have individual effects so you can unmute this you can add effects and of course the chain applies to every tap and we'll make this longer so that you can get more of an idea of what it's all about so so depending on what tap is chosen you can change the rate, the mix, the hertz for each tap, and you'll hear there'll be a different level of phase for each tap. And I think that is actually really cool. So those are the two that I led with, Pad Shop 2 and Multi-Tap, because I think that it's not so often that you get a brand new plugin or you get a brand new instrument, and those two, they're almost worth the price of admission combined. But the real killer feature that I think I'll use more than any others is this new feature. I don't know what Steinberg's calling it, but uh, it's a feature where you get two, where you get two tracks at once and you can mix them. So if I pull up uh, these two right here, we'll solo my bass, oops and my drums, and we'll zoom in, we'll loop them. This is what it sounds like. Okay, so I can look at my drums here, and I have just a uh, high pass on it, or a low cut, whatever. But what, the, re the way I was able to determine where to cut it is I can actually double up the view 
And if I go to my base, massive, which I'm generating that base, they're both soloed, and we can take a look. The orange will be massive, and the blue will be the uh, base, the four on the floor kick. And the cool thing is if I click on massive, I actually get that, that channel settings. So as you can see, with Massive, I've carved out a little of the frequency where the contact drums hit most. And uh, on contact, I've just uh, done a little low cut so that those Massive lows can ring through. But I think this heads up mixing, it's available in some third party plugins, but it's never really been available in Cubase. I think I'm gonna use this actually all the time and I'm stoked about it. And another thing that we can look at, and we'll just get rid of this, is if we, oops. If we just look at the uh, the contact, uh, now they've actually color coded the pre-filters and the actual uh, EQ bands. And I like that because it's just easier to see what's a filter and what's more of like a parametric band. And speaking of color coding, this is another thing that I like that they've done. Uh, they've moved post fader sends, or they've made them orange and they've made pre fader sends green, or blue I mean. So that's a post fader send, that's, and before it was just this tiny little thing. So it's either like a dot half moon means pre fader, half moon dot means post fader. Now if it's orange, it's post fader. If it's blue, it's pre fader. And that's the same for the mix console as well. So if I move the pre fader line above this, it'll turn orange. And that is uh, nice, I like that a lot. Uh, so that you can tell what is post fader and what is pre fader, especially with your sends. Okay, uh, now that I'm in the mixing console, we might as well go into a new feature. You can actually add colors to the channels in the mix console. I'll show you where that is. That's in files. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Edit, maybe? Yeah, edit, preferences, user interface, um, track and mix channel console colors. You can click this thing right here, mix console channels and apply. And then your channels will be the same colors as they are in the project window. Now this may be good if you're just trying to keep straight a bunch of things and you can highlight the selected channel. So if you select all of these, oh, you can okay it. Oops. Um, they'll all be highlighted. So the grays are the ones you're working on. Anything with the colors, the ones you're not working on. So that's just a stylistic change they've made that I think some people will find welcome. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is retrospective record. Uh, it's been front and center in Cubase for a while. You've been able to do it, but I think they've beefed it up with this release. And there's actually a button down here. That's also a dot and a crescent moon. They like to use that, uh, that iconography for a lot of stuff. But the cool thing about uh, retrospective record is if you're not recording, you can always just hit the button and you'll get it back. For instance, well, let's just check this out. You didn't hit record, but you just hit this button down here, boom, and there it is. Uh, it just pops right into place. So that's gonna be nice. It's gonna save you some uh, takes that you accidentally didn't do. And I think you can use it now with cycle recording and it just falls into different lanes. Um, and it's gonna be a nice feature for the future with this retrospective record. And so we're moving on to the final two. This is number six. And I'll go to this video file now because number seven is gonna be video. But uh, if we pull up our video, this is my video from last week about quick controls in Cubase. Let me unmute it. And we're back with another tutorial in Cubase 10. If you've used Cubase long, okay, uh, you get the idea. Now, when I make videos for Cubase, I actually uh, loudness normalize them in my video editor to YouTube standards, which is negative 18 LUFS, and that's why you see like nothing's peaking here. It's fine. Um, but the LUFS on this would be negative 18. Well, the cool thing is that Cubase didn't used to have loudness normalization. It was only peak normalization. Now it does. So if I select this and I go to my audio menu and I go to processes, normalize, um, 
what I want to show you is this is uh, loudness normalized to negative 18 LUFS, loudness units at full spectrum, I believe, is what it's short for. Well, I'm at 18 here. Uh, a lot of broadcast channels want you to normalize to negative 23. And that's a lot of times while you'll watch like a Stephen Colbert video or something on YouTube, and it'll be quieter than the other videos you see because it's actually normalized for television broadcast. So if you pull the slider down to negative 23, you hit apply, we'll watch the waveform get smaller. There, the processing's applied, and now uh, it's loudness normalized to negative 23 LUFS. That didn't used to exist in Cubase, and if you're working in a post-production environment where you're doing stuff for television, uh, that might be a godsend to you, to be honest. And then the final thing that is also a huge and killer feature is that you can now, we'll just highlight this little section, export video in Cubase, and it'll export as a H.264 codec. So I'll select this area and I'll go to File, Export, Video, New Cubase First Look, Sample. Okay, and we'll export it. It'll mix down the audio because I've changed the audio first. Of them. <clears throat> and that's all. Problem. The only little. So here I am with VLC, and this is a export of what I did. Um, the I see with quick controls is that you only get eight of them, and it's actually loudness normalized to negative twenty-three LUFS. Um, so those are my last two tips. You can loudness normalize now in Cubase, and you can export videos if you make a quick cut and you do some audio processing on it. You don't have to throw it back into a video editing program or provide detailed notes about the times at which uh, audio can go in. You can take a picture lock, work to picture, and then export uh, export the video as an H.264 file. So that is pretty huge. So those are my seven top things about the new Cubase. Pad Shop 2, multi-tap. You can uh, check the channel settings of two, set, uh, two tracks at once side by side. You can color your mix console. You can retrospective record easier. You have loudness normalization capabilities, and you can export video way easier than you used to be able to. And because of these seven reasons, I did the upgrade from Cubase 10, which was in the United States $60. And I feel like it's totally worth it. If you're upgrading from an older version, I guarantee you, I think that version 10.0 uh, had a lot of great brand new functionality and usability. So I think that the upgrade is worth it. But then again, it's up to you. If what you're working with is fine, you know, stick with that. Stick with the one that you came with. But that's it for me for now. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, video. I hope it's given you some uh, insight into the new features in Cubase 10. And take care of yourselves, everyone. If you enjoyed it, like, subscribe, do all the YouTube stuff down below, and I'll talk to you in the next one. Peace.